gathered in your name I'm calling out to you Your glory like a fire Awaken desire And pour our hearts with you Your voice is me Your voice is me singing You're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. Your voice will hear, your voice will see. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. I'm unmuted. There we go. So it's good to see you guys with us this morning. Glad you're here with us as Seymour Christians to lift up the name of Jesus and just praise his name. I want to let you know that this morning we're starting off service. We're going to have a moment of child dedication. And I just want to give you a little brief background of what child dedication is. You know, last week, uh, if you were here, you know, at the end of service, Sophie Kingery gave her life to Jesus Christ and was baptized. Let's celebrate that together. And part of that decision came from her growing up in a home uh, where the word of God was taught and where they lived and lived out what it means to be followers of Jesus as parents. And as a church, we were able to help and support her in that. And we know that it takes uh, more than raising kids in this day and age is tough. And it takes more than just, uh, you know, changing their diapers and, and feeding them and keeping them alive. There's so much more to parenting than that. And so we're going to have an opportunity here uh, to dedicate some children. These parents are going to have an opportunity to dedicate their children to the Lord. And we see this example in Scripture in 1 Samuel. As Hannah says, I will dedicate my child to serve the Lord all of his life. And then we see this also played out in the New Testament as Jesus, uh, his parents dedicate him in the temple as well. And so this is an opportunity for parents to say, we commit publicly to raising our kids in the love of the Lord. And we're going to have an opportunity as a church not only to witness that and to be part of that commitment that they're making, but for us to partner with them as well. And so I want us to take a moment. You're going to see up on the screen these kids that are going to be dedicated this morning. And parents, if you would come up during this time, you'll see Callahan O'Neill, that's right, and Caroline O'Neill. 
and Clayton Dobler. So parents, if you'd make your way up here, we're so glad that you are here with us this morning. I just want to introduce, I know most of you know them, but we've got Clayton Michael Dobler and his parents, Alex and Kelsey. Yeah, he's a little shy this morning. <laughs> and Caroline Fay and Callahan Joel. Aaron and Kenna O'Neill are dedicating them this morning, and so we're glad to have them here this morning. And they have some commitments that they're going to share with us, and so I'm going to put these up on the screen, and they've seen these ahead of time, and this is what they're committing to do as they raise their kids in the Lord. You see, the first commitment that they're making this morning is they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior as parents, and have decided that He will be the center of their home. Second commitment they're making is they believe the Bible is the word of God and they will read and obey it. The third commitment they're making before us is that they will invest time, energy, devotion, and prayer on behalf of their children to help them cultivate a relationship with Jesus. They agree that they need the support and the guidance of a Christian community. That's, and partially, partially that's us, to carry out their commitments. And that by dedicating their child to the Lord, their desire is that they will someday accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That they will make that decision, even if their parents have dedicated them and they've grown up and been trained in the ways of the Lord, to make that decision on their own to follow Jesus. So parents, if you guys agree to those, would you together in front of all of us say, we do? All right. And we have an opportunity as well. We know that raising kids isn't a solo effort. And so we want to, as the church here, partner with them as their family to help them on this journey that those of us who are parents know is sometimes difficult. And so, church, we have the commitment that we're going to make together for them as well. You'll see this up on the screen. And the commitment that we're going to make at Seymour Christian is that we will come alongside you as parents and support you wholeheartedly as you raise your children in the ways of the Lord. And church family, if you agree to that, would you together say, we do? We do. We do. All right, now that can include lots of things. Prayer, support, advice, friendship, uh, taking these little ones for the night so that they can go on a date night. That's said here, so someone's going to volunteer for that. So just ways that we can support and come alongside them as they raise their kids in the Lord. Let's take a moment and let's pray over these families. If you want to extend a hand just to show your support, we'd love for you to do that. And we're going to pray for you guys this morning. God, we thank you for these children. We thank you for their parents that have made the decision to raise them in your name. Uh, Lord, we know that parenting is, is hard. Uh, that there are going to be times when they are going to feel overwhelmed. And Lord, may we as their church family come along beside them in those moments uh, to give them the support and encouragement and prayer that they need. We pray for these children, Lord, that one day that they would make their own decision as Sophie did this last week to follow you. That their, the relationship that their parents have with you, that their church has with you, would be an example for them and what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So we pray blessings on these families. Uh, may everything that they do help them grow closer together as they grow closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and the church together said, amen. amen. Let's just congratulate them this morning. We've got a special gift that we just want to give you guys on behalf of the church. Thank you. Can you carry that for your parents? Because they have their hands full. <laughs> Thank you guys for making that commitment to follow Jesus and for raising your kids up in those commitments as well. Well, again, thank you for being here this morning. We've got a couple announcements that we want to go through uh, before we um, end our time or start our time here together. I'm going to grab my notes real quick. I've left the wrong paper up here. And if you were here last week, you know that I have a tendency sometimes to forget the announcements I'm supposed to give. So here we go. So we have next week, uh, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, a night of worship. This is an opportunity for us to gather in this room uh, to spend some time just worshiping the Lord together. And so I encourage you guys to be out here for that. Also, uh, this is an annual thing we've done here at the church. We have a Christmas family night. And this is on December 4th from 6 to 8. This is for all ages. All of us, we're going to gather together. We're going to have a meal catered by the Pines, some fun, some games. And you're going to see up here in the corner what's called a QR code. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity. If you, we need you to register for that so we can make sure that we have enough uh, food for everyone. You can take out your smartphone, even right now, and open up your camera app and point it, zoom in at that little funny little squiggly stuff in the bottom corner. And it'll take you right to a page, even right now, where you can register for that. 
Uh, you can register online. You can also register at a table out in the back. If that's confusing to you, stop ask any of us on staff, and we can try to help you with that. Uh, but that QR code is going to be available there. You can also find information in your bulletin about how to do that as well. We encourage you to sign up for that as soon as possible. And then on December 10th, we're having a children's uh, festival, a Christmas festival here at the building. And we want you to save the date for that. There's going to be opportunities for us to volunteer and to serve as we open and invite our community to come and celebrate the Christmas season, to celebrate the reason for the season. There's going to be all sorts of activities for families and kids and Santa's going to make an appearance and lots of great things. You can find out information about that and many other ministries we have going on in your bulletin. Well, let's take a moment and let's pray for our service, then we'll continue on in worship. God, once again, we thank you for these families that have made the decision to follow you and to raise their kids in the Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for that opportunity that we have as a church to partner with them and to continue to celebrate this morning the good things you're doing in our own lives, in the life of this church, in the life of this community. So God, I pray that over the next few minutes as we spend time lifting up your name, that we would be reminded of your power and your glory. Lord, we've already sung that this morning, that you would show us your power and glory, and you have done that. Help our eyes and our hearts to be open to seeing it. God, may everything we do this morning give you praise and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and the church together said, amen. amen. Let's stand together and worship. Intro, three, four, five, six. Lost, but he brought me and his love and his love for me. Who the sun sets free, who is free indeed. I'm the child of God, yes, I am. Do 
to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful every time oh, All I want is you Jesus All I want is you Refuge I run to You are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere There's a million reasons to trust you Nothing to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere Oh Jesus, you came to my rescue Took my place upon that cross You redeemed what I had lost Now my whole world went around you You're the center of my life you're the treasure, you're the prize Oh, all I want is you Jesus, all I want is you Oh, in you are the refuge I run to You are the fire that leads me through the night I'll follow you anywhere There's a million reasons to trust you Nothing to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere Follow you anywhere All I want is you Wherever you lead me Whatever it costs me oh, All I want is you Jesus, all I want is you oh, Wherever you lead me Whatever it costs me oh, to lead communion from time to time and it's an honor and a privilege to do, to do so it's a special moment in the service a unique time of worship where we commemorate the death of Jesus I've kept every communion meditation I've ever written more than anything I keep these for my own reference as a reminder of God's love and to remember the things I've been taught during my walk with God I'm not sure my devotions are useful to anyone for spiritual growth or spiritual direction. 
The prepared devotion oftentimes makes me wonder if the point is being made and understood. Is the message clear? Well, the message will be clear and simple today. It is this. Communion is a sacred time of fellowship with God. Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for you. He did this to take away your sins. There is a price for sin. A price for your iniquities, your rebellion, your disease, your grief and shame. And Jesus paid that price for you. For whoever believes in this birth, crucifixion and resurrection shall be forgiven and, and have eternal life in heaven forever. Christians, now is the time to bring your problems and uncleanliness to the foot of the cross. If you repent and leave all of that at the cross, it will be no more. The Bible says your sin will be forgiven, and here's the best part, forgotten, never to be remembered again. And it's that simple. That's what every communion message should be about the simplicity of the cross. The emblems you now hold are a reminder of that promise, a reminder of his love. So let's partake in communion together as a family, as a family of believers. Please take the bread that represents his broken body and partake. And the juice that represents his shed blood. Drink. And let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just thank you for communion. It's an, it's an opportunity for us to come. To come and meet you. To lay everything that we are concerned with, our unholiness, our sins our worries and put them at your feet. And Father, in this communion meditation, if there's one thing I could express that they would take from this today is that is that their sin is forgiven and forgotten. Father, I'm guilty of it. There's times I keep bringing a sin that I committed 10 years ago and I keep asking you to forgive me for that. And, and you remind me and you say, why do you keep bringing that up? Why do you keep reminding me of that? Stop. So, Father, what was brought today from each individual is still in them. It's over. You've been forgiven. It's done. I don't ever want to hear about it again, tell them. Father, we also bring a humble gift of an offering. Father, I say it all the time. It's our obligation and our duty to give. It's a privilege. So, Father, use this offering as an opportunity to further your kingdom. Father, bless the rest of the service. Bless the praise scene. Bless the children's ministry on the other side. And bless Stephen as he brings the message. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I your name oh yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy and all my days oh yes I will I can't 
the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. In the waiting, the same God who's never left is working all things out. You working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Oh my days. Oh yes, I will for my days. Oh yes, I will, and I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all men. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all men. Nothing can stand against. I choose to pray. Choose to pray, to glorify, glorify the name of all men. Nothing can stand again. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will. Yeah. Oh yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy, all oh, my days, oh yes, I will. For all my days, oh yes, I will. For all my days, yes, I will. We've all got someone that's just hard for us to love. Even people that we do love, our kids, our family, maybe even our best friend, our spouse, we have those times when, frankly, we just get annoyed, right? Well, this week I found a quiz that you can take to see how difficult you are to deal with. (laughs) It's not one of those BuzzFeed quizzes, you know, those silly ones. This is a legit test. It's a short test put together by a personality psychologist that would tell you how annoying someone is. So of course I took the test. And I'm not gonna tell you my score. (laughs) But we've all got them, people who are hard to love. When I was growing up, we had a phrase for these folks. We would say uh, that they are an EGR. Do we know what that stands for? An extra grace required. (laughs) And truth be told, the reality is, is that you might be one of them. We've all got them, people who are hard to love. A Christian scientist and a professor once said, the fellow who thinks he knows it all is especially annoying to those of us who do. (laughs) Today we're ending a series called Hard to Love, Dealing with Difficult People. And we've been looking at how to deal with family members who are difficult because of sin because of the sin and conflict and dysfunction that exists in each of our lives. And last week, Matt taught us three principles of loving our enemies. If you weren't here last week, I really encourage you, go online and listen to that message. He did a great job unpacking what it means to love our enemies. And this week, we're going to look at how to love those who are different than us. See, we each have interactions, whether it's at work, school, online, and yes, even here at church, where we find ourselves dealing with people who are difficult to love. And often, not always, but often, people who need the most love are often the most difficult to love. Rick Warren said this. He said, the less you've been loved, the more obnoxious you can be. 
You think about that. The less you've been loved, the more obnoxious you can be. And I think there's some truth to that. But before we go any further, I want to make sure that we understand something. This is mission critical for understanding what we're going to talk about this morning. Just because you're different doesn't mean you're difficult. Right? Different people doesn't mean difficult. So we're in a series talking about what it means to be hard to love and how, how can we love those who are hard to love. And the subtitle is Dealing with Difficult People. And this morning we're talking about dealing with those who are different from us. But I want us to understand that different doesn't always mean difficult. Someone being different than us doesn't mean that they're automatically difficult to deal with, but they are different. And acknowledging that is okay and recognizes that sometimes those who are different from us are difficult to deal with. Maybe not because of anything that they have done, but just because they're different. We've just come out of a week where we are probably more aware of the differences that are among us. After all, it was an election week. And I really dislike these weeks, especially the weeks leading up to the election. It tends to bring out the worst in people. And even though this was just a primary so we didn't get the full force of political marketing or name smearing, it also brings out an opportunity for people to express their differences. And that's a good thing. But the way that those differences are expressed are not always productive. Those differences are often expressed in ways that make it difficult to deal with some people. We really see this online. My wife told me a story this week. The day after the election, she was going through some friends' Facebook stories, and this person started, it's nobody in this room first, let me just tell you there, because someone's gonna be thinking, I wonder if they're talking about no one that you guys know, but started talking about her faith and how she really knew that Jesus was in charge of the election process, so she didn't need to worry about it. So far, so good, great encouragement. But then towards the end of her post, she mentioned who she voted for and then went on to say that anyone who voted for the other candidate was an idiot. <laughs> idiot. Maybe you've heard that said. Maybe you've said that. Maybe you've heard that said about you. So I'd like to give us a little tool this morning when we're struggling with loving someone different than us. When you're tempted to think, and some of us say, idiot. I want us to look at the word idiot for a moment. We're going to give you a little acronym for this. This is a word you probably thought I'd never hear taught on in church. But this is a word that we use often, whether we say it or not, to think that someone's different. We don't we dislike someone. But they're just an idiot. So let's unpack this word. I. It tells us that we, that person is made in the image of God. Recognizing that every person, those who are different from us, even those who are difficult to love, are made in the image of God. There's a phrase for this. It's called imago Dei. It's those who are made in the image of God. It applies to all mankind. We understand this when it applies to us. You might be familiar with the Psalm 139, 14. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But it also, we need to realize, it applies to those beyond us those who are not like us. And it doesn't just apply to followers of Jesus. It applies to everyone. We are all made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. This means that even those who we disagree with, even those, as we learned last week, who are our enemies, even those who actively work against the cause of Christ. We love each other, even those who are different than us, because in each person, there is the image of God. We're all image bearers. So I, the image of God. The next letter in that word, D, reminds us that we should demonstrate interest. That we should demonstrate interest. Theodore Roosevelt said a famous quote, you probably heard it, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? Jesus had his own way of dealing this. In Matthew chapter 9, 36, he said, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus expressed interest in all those he came in contact with. We especially see this in regards to people that were different than him and those that the world looked at 
as difficult to love. We see this in Zacchaeus, the story of the wee little man who was shunned by society for his career choices, for the way that he treated others. He deserved to be outcast, but Jesus showed interest in him. We see this in the woman at the well in John chapter 4. This was, after all, a woman in that society. Jesus should not have paid any interest to her. And on top of that, she was a Samaritan woman. If you know anything about that culture, they were despised. They were the enemies, as we learned last week. Another example we see in Scripture is Jesus' encounter with the blind beggars in Matthew chapter 20. If you've got your Bibles, let's open up to that. I want us to read this one because we're not quite as familiar with this one as maybe Zacchaeus and the woman at the well. But Matthew chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 29. There's a story of an encounter that Jesus had with two men. It says, As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho, a large crowd followed behind. Two blind men were sitting near the road. When they heard that Jesus was coming that way, they began shouting, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet, the crowd yelled at them. But they only shouted louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. When Jesus heard them, he stopped and called, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they said, we want to see Jesus felt sorry for them. He had compassion on them, Scripture says, and touched their eyes. Instantly they could see, and they followed him. See, while the rest of the world was annoyed with these guys, actually told them, pipe down, quit interrupting, stay in your corner. The only person to express interest in them was Jesus. He might have been the only person to express interest in them for years. They were unseen they were on the margins of society. And they were just an annoyance to those around him. But to Jesus, they were image bearers. See, people who need the most love are often the most difficult to love. These men, they needed attention. They needed the love. Of course, they needed healing, but they needed love. And Jesus, he stopped and he listened to them. He stopped and he listened to them. He demonstrated interest. See, Jesus moved towards the people that we usually move away from. Those in society that are different than us. Maybe from nothing that they have done. Or maybe from the choices they've made. Whoever they were that we see time and time again in Scripture, that Jesus moved towards the very people that you and I often move away from. See, we gravitate towards people who are like us and avoid those people who bother us. But Jesus, he dined with sinners. He touched the unclean. He listened and honored women in a society that shunned them. He honored those from different nationalities and cultures. Jesus' comfort zone was incredibly large, much bigger than most of ours. People that we don't feel comfortable with are the very people that Jesus moved towards. Jesus' comfort zone was incredibly large. And maybe we can take a cue from Jesus and express interest in others. Now, what could that look like? Your single friend who's longing for a relationship and feels ostracized because all of her friends are married. Those with special needs and those who the rest of the world often dismiss. Those who are being annoying. Maybe your annoying neighbor who's loud and obnoxious, your coworker who bashes your faith in God and maybe calls you some unkind names because you believe in the sanctity of life. Or that person on the internet who insults your desire to care for immigrants you see coming into our country seeking a better way of life. See, God expressed interest in us even when we didn't express interest in him. God expressed interest in us even when we expressed no interest in him. Ephesians chapter 2 says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. That's the key we need to remember in a moment. Just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, 
the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nat- by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So we need to remember that everyone is an image bearer, made in the image of God. We need to demonstrate interest in others. In the next letter, I, we need to invite questions. Ask yourself, where is this difficulty coming from? Is it coming from something in their past? A hurt that they're dealing with? The situation they've been brought up in? Something that's completely maybe beyond their control? Or a decision they've made that have led them to this? Or is it something that you've done? Is there something that I have done that's making this situation with this person difficult to deal with? Why do they feel the way they feel? And to take a cue from the last one with Jesus... Can I just get to know them? Can I ask, why do you feel this way? If they're lashing out in anger, maybe it's a pain that you've caused. Sometimes it's none of those things. Sometimes it's just, I use the word hangry, right? You just had a bad day. Your blood sugar is low. There might be something going on, you're just hangry. But ask yourself, invite questions. Why is this situation, why is this person right now, why do I view them as difficult to love? And oh, keep an open mind. See, as you deal with people who are different from you, especially those who are challenging to you, ask yourself this, what can I learn? What can I learn here? Now, obviously, there are times and situations you find yourself dealing with a difference that are indeed caused by something that's right or wrong. And we'll get to that in a moment. But often, we struggle to love those who we just disagree with. We just have a difference of opinion. And maybe, just maybe, there's something for us to learn. See, God often uses the differences in other people in my life to expose sin in my life. God often uses differences in other people to expose sin in my life or misunderstandings or ways that I'm wrong. How many of you this morning when we were going through child dedication, you might have had kids that are older now and you remember a time when you said, maybe before you had kids, you saw a kid acting up at the store, throwing a tantrum at the mall. You said, I would never let my kid do that where you see some choices that some parents are making, you say, I will never do that. And then we know many times we find ourselves in those situations, and from a different perspective, we see things differently. So ask yourself, what can I learn here? See, once we get to know someone, we may find that we've judged them incorrectly. We have a tendency to often rank people's sins except our own. So we look at the sin in someone else's life and we don't realize that once again, the passage that we read just a minute ago reminds us that we were all sinners. There's a passage of scripture that reminds us of this. It's in Matthew chapter seven. It says, do not judge others and you will not be judged for you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that speck out of your eye, which it never really sounds quite that helpful when you say that, do we? When you can't see the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. Jesus isn't mixing words here. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. C.S. Lewis has this quote from his book, The Trouble with X, an essay that he's written. He says, abstain from all thinking about other people's faults, unless your duties as a teacher or parent make it necessary to think about them. 
Whenever the thoughts come unnecessarily into one's mind, why not simply shove them away and think of one's own faults instead? For there, with God's help, one can do something. Of all the awkward people in your house or job, there is only one whom you can improve very much. Amen, that's right. Keep an open mind. What can you learn from this situation of this person that's maybe difficult for you to deal with? And finally, T, truth in love. Two things, truth and love. But let's start with the last, because you have to do it in this order, love. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Only after we do that do we try to speak truth into someone's life. We often get this backwards. We get it backwards in our conversations. We get it backwards in internet posts. Only after we have loved do we then speak truth. Ephesians 4, 14 says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. 1 Peter 3, 15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. There's a lot to unpack here. We should speak the truth in love. Those times when we have differences with someone, we see them going down the wrong path. We should love them and then speak truth into their lives. But there's some things going on in First Peter here. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to who? Everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's a difference. Now, those people, they're difficult to love. We can have that opportunity for them to ask when we follow those other principles, when we recognize that they are made in the image of God, when we've demonstrated interest, when we've invited questions when we've kept an open mind and then we can speak the truth in love with gentleness and respect as first peter says so i want us to consider one question this morning who do you find difficult to love because they are different than you who do you find difficult to love because they are different than you don't say it out loud don't nudge the person next to you this can mean all sorts of things Maybe they have a different temperament. Maybe you struggle with people of a different nationality, different ethnic background, different socioeconomic status. Maybe you have difficult dealing with people that have different skin color than you do or vote differently than you do. Maybe it's that annoying neighbor who just grinds on your last nerve or your coworker who's always stealing your ideas Maybe it's someone who, by no fault of their own, is just different, marginalized by society. Who do you find difficult to love because they're different from you? They're often those that we overlook or avoid, those who make us feel uncomfortable. Now, the reality is they don't make us feel uncomfortable. We're choosing that, right? Or sometimes they're just difficult to give grace to, the extra grace required folks. Those who we may treat like idiots because we don't understand them. Or maybe they don't truly deserve our love. But instead of lashing out, instead of tuning out, what if we lived out 1 John chapter 4, verse 12? But dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in 
us. The world sees God through the way that we love or don't love those who are around us. See, we have the opportunity with our families, with our enemies, those who are different, to be Jesus. When we're tempted to look down on others or just plain avoid them, when we're tempted to think, idiot, can we remember the way that Jesus dealt with people who were hard to love? Us, who live and love incredibly imperfectly, who wound and who are wounded, who make mistake after mistake, yet we are created in the image of God. He took interest in us and offered us what we didn't deserve, love. Philippians 2, 4 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, a servant, those who many of the world would say, avoid them, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's cross, death on a cross. That's love. That's grace. And that kind of grace, living out love like Jesus did, that grace is contagious. If we can offer grace even to those who are hard to love or who we find hard to love, only then can we call ourselves followers of Christ. Because how we love others reflects how we love God. This one phrase sums up this whole series. As we've looked at how to deal with difficult family members, as we've looked at how do you really love your enemies, those who are actively working against you, and how do we love, how do we interact with people who are different than us, who we struggle to find relationship with, to sometimes even be able to stand. How we love others reflects how we love God. We can't fail in these others, loving our family, loving our enemies, and loving those who are different than us that we find difficult and call ourselves lovers of God. How we love others reflects how we love God. Colossians 3 says, Since God chose you to be holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that at just the right time, that even though we expressed no interest in you, you expressed an amazing interest in us, that you called us out as image bearers, as children of God, Lord, that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us, the ultimate example of what it means to love people who are hard to love. So God, may we recognize that that same grace that you've given us, we need to give to others, to our family members, when they grate on our nerves or when they push us, when they work against us, Lord, in certain ways, may we recognize that we are called to love. Those that actively work against us, Lord, working against the cause of your name even, our enemies, may we recognize that we are called to love to give grace. And Lord, for those that are different than us, those who we find difficult to deal with because of maybe their choices, their outlook on life, or something completely arbitrary, something beyond their control, 
the families they were born into, the way they look, their background, Lord, the hurts they might have experienced, whatever it might be, Lord, those who are different than us, help us to not say idiot, but to recognize that they are made in the image of God, that we would express interest in them as you expressed interest in us. God, may we be people who are pursuing the very people that the world shuns. God, may we be people who are living out, living out the gospel, being a light to this world. God, may all that we do be a reflection of the love that we have for you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship. Every song we could ever see Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe And live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up. Oh, 
heart of your life It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken I will bear my life upon your life It is a firm foundation And I May we put lives on your love. We're people who shine your love, living out that firm foundation. We ask all this in your name. Thank you guys for being here with us this morning. You might have seen all these things we have up here, these boxes. Uh, we know that we are in Operation Christmas Child mode here, and I want to thank all of you. These actually are stacked even two rows deep here. Uh, it, it is not too late to contribute to this ministry. You can find boxes outside at the table. Uh, during the week, you can bring these in here. But this is just a great expression of God's love, amen, to help those kids across the world to celebrate Christmas, to know there are people here in Seymour, Indiana who love, who care for them. So we thank you for that. If you need prayer, if you have any questions about what it means uh, to receive the love of Jesus, even without the interest we might have had in him, if you've decided this morning, actually, I'm interested. I want to know more of this love that Jesus has for me. I encourage you, come up here. We'd love to speak with you. If you need prayer, uh, we want to reach out and just pray for you. I encourage you guys to be here next week. Glad uh, that you're joining us here this morning, and have a great week. God bless you guys.